Good morning. Everybody uh, seems to have survived the Thanksgiving holiday, the second exam. Um, as, a, as a quick reminder on the exams, your scores and grades in general, um, bear in mind that the um, cutoff numbers that are posted in the syllabus for what grade goes with what percentage um, are subject to some flexibility. Um, and typically, the, depending on the distribution of grades in the class, um, the B cutoff is more generous than what is posted in the syllabus. Um, the A cutoff is rarely more generous than what is posted in the syllabus. Um, and then the AB is somewhere in between. So um, if you're one of those people who goes through and tries to calculate what you might get, sort of like my kids do with their Christmas list, um, you will um, not really know, um, except for when you're looking at the A cutoff, you can be pretty sure that it's going to be within um, a couple of tenths of a point of what's in the syllabus. Uh, so now we begin the third section of the course. Um, this is the application of what you've learned in the first two sections to uh, different areas and reinforcing the concepts that you've learned with um, practical aspects of epidemiology in the real world. Um, we're starting with environmental epidemiology. Um, and uh, in, in past years, uh, this lecture has been given by Jonathan Patz, who's the director of the Center for uh, Global Health. He's a member of the uh, IPCC and is therefore one two thousandth recipient of the Nobel Prize um, for his work on the IPCC. And when I talked to Jonathan about it this year, he said, um, really, uh, VJ will do a much better job than I will do, so you should have him give the lecture this year while you have the opportunity. Um, and I, uh, I thought that was a, a great uh, idea. So today we are fortunate to have um, VJ give the lecture on environmental epidemiology, um, and uh, he will be completely responsible for the uh, information that he presents today and for answering any questions about it. So. All right. I think I'm good here, yeah? You, uh, good. All right. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Um, all right. So yeah, I'm a, a joint PhD student here at UW. Um, I'm in the epidemiology program in the Population Health Sciences Department. Uh, and then the other half of my program is in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of the Nelson Institute before? All right, good. <clears throat> OK, so just uh, a roadmap of where we're headed today in the lecture. Um, I'll talk a little bit and give you an overview of environmental health issues. Um, we'll talk a little bit about exposure assessment, um, because that's one of the key challenges of research in environmental epidemiology. Then we'll go into a bunch of case studies looking at health risks associated with various types of environmental change. Um, so we'll start with some land cover examples uh, and talk more specifically about heat stress, chronic disease, and infectious diseases associated with land use and land cover change. Uh, then we'll get into some air quality topics, which is actually my area of focus in my research, uh, some water quality and quantity issues, uh, and then we'll wrap up with a discussion on environmental health policy co-benefits and opportunities for interventions to improve health. So I'm going to start where we began in this class way back in September um, with Jon Snow and the cholera uh, episode and the outbreak investigation that we all um, heard about from Dr. Sethi. Um, and so Jon Snow is often considered sort of the father of epidemiology, and we might also consider him um, one of the pioneers env of environmental epidemiology because Jon Snow focused on the location of cholera episodes and the specific environmental characteristics that conferred risk to different populations in London. So these are some sample results um, showing deaths from cholera adjusted. So this is per 10,000 inhabitants in London in 1848. And you can see that there's a clear relationship between um, elevation and cholera incidence. John Snow, of course, narrowed it down to the water supply issue. Here you can see that the uh, death rate way over on the right for 10,000 houses um, was particularly high for the first uh, water supply source. So you probably realize that cholera remains um, an environmental health challenge worldwide. We see about 3 to 5 million cases a year and about 100,000 deaths. Um, this is an example of how cholera, as a waterborne disease, is closely linked to environmental conditions. So here in the solid line, uh, you see percent cholera cases in 
um, in Bangladesh in 1994. Um, and in the dotted line, you see ocean sea surface temperatures um, that are fluctuating over time. And that's due to a phenomenon that a lot of you have probably heard of, um, El Nino cycles. So um, due to El Nino, monsoon winds are linked um, to changes in sea surface temperature and the growth of phytoplankton, um, which is a nutrient that promotes the growth of the cholera bacterium. So um, we can see that the environmental sort of uh, characteristics that we're able to zero in on have changed. Um, but a lot of the public health challenges that we've been talking about for a while in this course remain. And we'll return to cholera and actually the example in Haiti uh, a little later in the lecture. So we'll step back from that example, and I'll just give you a general definition of what environmental epidemiology is. We're concerned with the impact of the physical environment on human health, um, and we're concerned of, about different types of environments that you and I and all of us encounter throughout our day, so the places where we work, where we go to school, where we play, et cetera. Uh, and it's because of these different environments and these different uh, population exposures that we consider uh, causes and effects at different scales and different levels. So we'll talk today about some societal uh, concerns in terms of exposure uh, and drivers of climate change. Uh, community and neighborhood effects are particularly important um, for uh, a few case studies that I'll mention today and also zeroing down to a smaller scale of a family and an individual level. So these different scales and levels means that we have different policy tools uh, available to us to improve environmental health conditions. Uh, this next figure uh, is a graph of environmental risk factors published by the WHO in the year 2002. Uh, and so this these colors here are indicating different uh, rates of disability-adjusted life years. How many of you are familiar with, with dailies? Okay, who wants to shout out their, their knowledge of what a daily is? Don't be shy. I heard, I saw all those hands go up. <laughs> no one's comfortable? Okay, so a disability-adjusted life year, I'll, I'll give you the answer, is um, the number of years loss due to both uh, ill health, disability, and early death. So we have an idea of what a person's life expectancy should be based on where they are in the world. Um, and we can understand through this combined metric, this daily metric, um, what the impacts of morbidity and, and premature mortality are. So as you can see, it's not surprising here, a lot of these disability-adjusted life years are concentrated in developing countries. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that about 24% of the global burden of disease total is attributable to environmental risk factors, uh, and that that figure is even higher, closer to about 33% for children. <clears throat> and so I um, just want to drive home the point that those uh, environmental risk factors and those causes are linked to um, huge tallies of early mortality. So it's estimated about 13 million annual deaths are attributable to environmental causes. And again, for children, um, that figure is huge, about 4 million. Uh, again, mostly concentrated in developing countries. So that's sort of treating all environmental-related disease the same. But I wanted to zero in on specific causes um, of environmental-related disease and what uh, we focus on around the world. So hopefully, this is somewhat legible. You see near the top. We have things like diarrheal disease, respiratory infections, which I'll talk about a little today in terms of air quality, um, injuries, malaria, road traffic injuries are a big problem in developing countries um, where land use and transportation issues um, are sort of uh, challenging and remain challenging. So you'll notice here that we've got quite a mix of uh, causes and environmental fractions. Um, and around the world, we see um, increasingly a mix of the burden of disease depending on a country's development trajectory. So um, I want to introduce the topic of the epidemiologic transition to you all. Um, this is um, <clears throat> a documented pattern that countries go through as they transition um, through economic growth. Um, and it's basically a transition from communicable infectious forms of disease to non-communicable forms. So you can see um, that those curves are sort of um, crossing each other at this midpoint where we've identified a uh, developing country such as India that is dealing with both uh, a burden of infectious disease, things like malaria, dengue, cholera, like I mentioned before, but also um, a new and increasing burden of chronic disease, 
So things like diabetes, respiratory infections, um, are still a burden on the system there. So we've got a lot of countries, in fact, that are dealing with health concerns at both ends of the spectrum, and that presents particular um, policy concerns. So this is a figure from Gordis um, that gives you an idea of the different types of uh, study design that we've reviewed this semester. Um, and so in research in environmental epi actually focuses on sort of the sweet spot, these three boxes in the middle. Um, and I'll give you some examples today of case control studies that are being conducted on the landscape scale to understand disease patterns, um, cross-sectional studies like the survey of the health of Wisconsin that you heard about earlier from Dr. Nieto, and also cohort studies, which are a big source of data for people doing air pollution epidemiology. So we have two primary approaches to research in environmental epi. Um, the first situation is which, in which we have a known exposure and we're interested in understanding what the health effects of that exposure are. Uh, and for that approach, we consider a number of study designs, so cross-sectional studies like show that I mentioned earlier, um, cohort studies, are descriptive studies where we're just trying to understand patterns and relationships, but not necessarily causality. The other situation is which uh, we see a disease pattern and we, un we want to understand um, what environmental factors are associated with risk, and we don't have a causal explanation in mind. Um, so it's in these cases that the ecological approach is common, along with case control and, again, descriptive studies. Um, an important consideration in environmental epi is the exposure, dose, and effect continuum in which we try to understand what environmental exposures are and how they ultimately lead to disease outcomes in human populations. So it's important to consider that we can't just connect um, an exposure, say, ambient air pollution to disease outcomes in populations, right? We need to consider how much uh, polluted air a person might be inhaling, how much of that is directly exhaled, how much would be a biologically effective dose to cause change in cell function and structure, and what could ultimately cause clinical disease. And so depending on the environmental risk factor that we're considering, we're going to need to wait a certain amount of time to see an actual disease outcome. But we might be able to use biological markers to understand what the effect of disease is before we actually see um, the disease outcome itself. So in terms of assessing exposure, we're interested in the dose characteristics. So remember, earlier this semester, we talked about the dose-response relationship as one of the causal criteria for establishing or assessing disease causality and that relationship. So in terms of the dose, we consider the magnitude of the dose, how large or small is it, the frequency of it, and how long is it lasting. Um, we're interested in whether these doses are chronic or over long periods of time or acute whether they're relatively common or rare, and what that means for whether we're going to conduct something like a case control study, which is for what types of exposures? Potentially rare diseases, right? Or a cohort study where we might um, have a particular exposure in mind. Um, and then also the exposure pathway. Or like I mentioned, are people breathing in these pollutants? Um, are they being ingested, or is it dermal exposure, et cetera? And often there's complicated exposure pathways that go beyond the simple list. Um, so we have a number of sources for exposure data, both active and passive. So we've talked a bit this semester about medical records and exams, um, interviews and surveys that we can conduct with folks and what types of bias may be introduced if we haven't taken the appropriate measures with those interviews. Um, biological specimens are these biological markers that may be uh, early indicators of disease. And also environmental measures and surveys. So just like we uh, conduct the show assessment and, and conduct um, interviews with um, study participants. We can also do surveys of the places where they live and understand something about the built environment um, that affects their health. So we have a number of strategies for exposure assessment, and based on uh, our available resources, we can zero in on sort of these things towards the top of the list, which may best approximate the actual exposure. Um, but given some of the limits uh, logistically or financially, we may have to zero down uh, and work further down this list. So we start at the top with personal measurements, which are often considered the gold standard um, for environmental exposure assessment. So we've had students in this department who've gone to other countries and actually strapped up folks with personal air monitors and followed them um, for uh, periods of time to understand what their actual exposures are. Um, oftentimes, a study like that is, is not possible, um, or conducting lots of studies like that is not possible. And so we have to 
um, step back a bit further and conduct exposure assessment in the vicinity of where these people live um, at some distance and duration from their residence. And then uh, quite a few studies at the ecological level focus on defined geographic areas like a county or even a state um, to try to understand what's happening in terms of exposures that may be monitored at that larger level like air quality um, and personal health outcomes. So we'll talk uh, quite a bit more about exposure assessment through the case studies. So now we're going to get into some topics um, of specific environmental change. Um, anyone know what, we, what milestone we recently, hypothetically, passed in terms of world population? Seven billion, right. Um, I thought this was a cool example because it's a composite image put together by NASA. And oftentimes, when we don't have population density information, we can use um, indicators like this or the nightlight concentrations to understand where, where folks are living. It's one metric that's used sometimes. So in terms of global change, I hope I don't have to convince most of you that climate change is real. I think that's becoming uh, an increasingly common belief among most of the American population, thankfully. Um, and so this is a graph of temperature, global, globally average temperature um, uh, put out by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on climate change. And so this is a team of more um, than 100 leading scientists from around the world who look into climate change and the ultimate effects. Um, and so one piece of that project is the health effects. And so you can see this black line is the documented temperature pattern um, <clears throat> going back to 1900. And these colored lines, um, I should update this, are looking forward from the year 2000. And so this is, a, again, a globally averaged picture of what the temperature situation looks like. Unfortunately, the trajectory trajectory, sorry, that we're currently on is this red line, this A2 scenario um, that's associated with about a three degree overall temperature increase by the end of this century. Um, for any of you who are interested in CO2 numbers, that's associated with about a 580 parts per million um, concentration in the atmosphere. We're at, at roughly 480 right now. So that's sort of a, a bleak picture. Um, and it's important to consider not only the temperature effect of climate change, but also other effects on the environment and eventually human health. Um, so this is a figure that um, my advisor published and, and is sort of commonly cited in the environmental epi world in terms of the health effects uh, expected as a result of climate change. So I want you to focus first over here on the left. So we have that temperature rise that I mentioned, that three degree average global temperature increase that's projected. Um, but we also have other important geophysical changes happening, right? We have sea level rise that's expected to reach about 40 centimeters by the end of the century and also changes in the weather cycle and the hydrologic cycle that have important effects um, downstream. So this is a, a figure that gives you an idea of the categories of health impacts that, that are expected to occur as a result of climate change. Um, and we'll go into quite a few of the case studies um, later on. But I want to give you a general idea of sort of the big topics. So how many of you have heard of the urban heat island effect? OK, we'll explain that a little further. Um, air pollution is a big issue because a lot of air pollutants are closely tied uh, to temperature. So Los Angeles has a big ozone problem for one part because lots of people drive out there, but also because the weather out there favors ozone and smog formation. Um, Vector-borne diseases, malaria is the classic example for climate change in terms of the habitat available to mosquito vectors that help transmit the disease. Um, waterborne disease, I mentioned the cholera example, and we'll get into that a little further. I'm not going to talk a whole lot today about the food supply and environmental refugee issues, although those are huge, and we have people here at UW who are looking closely into um, what sea level rise in particular means for where populations can live and what that, mean for, uh, what that might mean for geopolitical issues. So the take home here is that climate change is a complicated phenomenon, and it's going to be equally complicated in terms of health outcomes. Um, this is from a paper that came out just earlier this year in terms of environmental epi and what we can do um, to address climate change related health issues. Uh, and so you see that they've identified both direct and indirect pathways. So these direct things are things like flood and storm related injuries, like we saw with Hurricane Sandy, a lot of discussion in the news media in terms of climate change and what that means. Um, for the frequency of uh, such uh, catastrophic storm events. Um, also, the temperature-related issues and heat wave stress is, is uh, an important issue to consider. But we've got all these indirect pathways to consider, right, which are really complicated issues and require folks who are trained in epidemiology, but also environmental studies, geography, political science, et cetera, 
uh, to be able to understand these complicated mechanisms. So we've got a couple here in terms of agriculture, uh, disease vectors, food, waterborne disease, et cetera. So the take home here is that the health effects of, of global climate change are complicated. There's many exposure pathways. Oftentimes there's not a single cause and effect that's driving um, this relationship. And oftentimes we've got these interrelated feedbacks that we need to consider um, in terms of shaping policy and hopefully avoiding unintended consequences. So I'll transition um, first to a discussion about our land system and how change in land cover uh, is linked to human health. And we'll start with uh, chronic disease and heat stress. So this is a figure um, giving you an idea of, hopefully you can sort of see it, the number of megacities in the world. And so we work through time starting from the bottom up. So in 1950, um, there was just one city with a population of more than 10 million. Can you sort of, actually, you know, in North America, what, what that city was? Can you see this? New York, right. Um, so in 2015, it's estimated that there will be 21 cities um, exceeding 10 million uh, people, and that the number of urban areas uh, with populations between 5 and 10 million will also be huge. From It'll go from 7 um, to about 40. Um, and so you can see that a lot of this growth in huge cities will occur in developing countries. And these are places that are, at present, oftentimes ill-equipped infrastructurally to deal with population um, burden. So oftentimes they're unable to provide adequate transportation, housing, water, and sewer services to existing populations. Uh, and so you can imagine what this uh, might pose in terms of challenges in the future. Um, urban growth is a worry um, for a number of reasons. Um, first, I want to mention this urban heat island effect. So a few of you mentioned familiarity with this, but I'll, I'll just give a, a brief overview. So this is a temperature profile um, of uh, trying to sort of demonstrate what the urban heat island effect is. And basically the main cause of the urban heat island effect, why we see this spike in the downtown area that's heavily paved compared to um, other parts, is the modification of the land service um, by materials which effectively re retain heat. So we've got uh, an imbalance in the energy, uh, sorry, in the energy balance uh, of the area, and we have surfaces like concrete, asphalt that effectively retain heat. Um, we also, incidentally, have downtown areas that sometimes lack natural vegetation, and so that lack of evapotranspiration means that we sort of exacerbate the effect. And so this is something that's been documented around the world, uh, and it's why we talk about things like green roofs and increasing green space in urban areas to reduce the temperature disparity. Um, so in addition to just the extent of land that we, sorry. So sorry, can you say one? Yeah, why it's hotter, why is that a problem in urban areas? Why are we worried about that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll get into that a little, a little bit later, but we'll consider um, issues of heat stress. So heat waves are the natural disasters that have caused the most mortality in the U.S., for sure. Um, and so oftentimes we have lots of people living in concentrated areas in these areas that are hotter. Um, so these are people that may not um, have access to things like air conditioning. They may be elderly, vulnerable for other reasons. And so it's a worry if we've got more people living in, in hotter areas. And it's not just heat stress. Um, it's things like renal disease, um, and there's so there are other health effects that I'll talk about a little later in terms of why that's a worry. Um, so we need to consider not just the extent of the area that we're paving by building all these huge cities, right, but how we build those cities. Um, and community design is a big focus and a big hot topic in environmental epidemiology. Um, this is an example um, here of a disconnected landscape in which we have different land uses that are isolated from one another. So here we've got um, a residential situation over on the right. You can imagine someone living in a spot like this. Maybe this looks familiar to some of you. Um, it's probably an automobile-reliant culture, right? You're going to have to jump in a car to get to school or work, to do your shopping, your activities of your daily life. Um, and so that reliance on the automobile is clearly linked to uh, physical activity and the amount of time that people have to get out and exercise, right? And so the way that we build our cities is really important for shaping, for shaping health. 
we can contrast the situation for an individual household to someone living in a more connected landscape in which we've got um, policies which favor the integrated uh, land use design. So we've got an example here that's probably, I think, Europe, right? Uh, looks like a situation in which we have folks who are living uh, in residential areas, but those areas are mixed with commercial development, green space, et cetera. So these folks don't have to rely on a car to get around. Oftentimes, they can walk or take public transit, transportation or bike, uh, more active forms of transportation, which favor uh, physical activity throughout the day. So the idea, right, is that we can meet physical activity recommendations by just our activities of daily life. Maybe we don't have to carve out an hour to go to the gym because we live far away from a gym. We can actually walk to work or school, et cetera. And so this is, like I mentioned, a big focus of the environmental epi uh, literature. This is just an example from one study um, looking at Atlanta uh, and the mixed use uh, situation. So here we've got on the, on the graph the probability of obesity on the y-axis and the land use mix relative uh, on the, on the x-axis. You can see that as we move to an area that has more mixed use, more of a connected landscape, we have a lower probability of obesity. Um, so this example may not convince you, um, but the good thing is that the survey of the health of Wisconsin, which you all heard about from Dr. Uh, Nieto, is conducting two ancillary studies. So we've got the survey of the health of Wisconsin, which is a cross-sectional study looking at the health of populations in the entire state. Um, and we have these two ancillary studies, Anusi and Wasabi. How many of you have heard of these two? Okay, so who knows what Anusi is? Josie, what's Anusi? Right, and what's Wasabi? It's not sushi. Wasabi is an assessment of the built environment. So these are ancillary studies that are being conducted to take advantage of population data that's available through the primary show study. Um, so colleagues in my group work uh, specifically on, on the Wasabi um, study to understand what the built environment means for health. So I'm going to skip over, hopefully all of you are familiar with the show. If not, these slides will be posted. Um, so Wasabi, like I said, is the assessment of the social and built environment around the state, um, an ancillary study. Um, that asks the question whether uh, environments are promoting things like physical inactivity, automobile dependency, et cetera, poor diet, something that's further addressed through the ANUSI study. Um, so if any of you are MPH students, um, we have a number of folks who have helped out with Wasabi implementation. Um, and so this is an example of the instrument that's used through that study. Um, hopefully it's somewhat legible. So you can see that these these folks, these teams, go out to different parts of the state that have been carefully selected to understand what the built environment looks like. So they're marking down all sorts of things from weather conditions way at the top to the types of buildings uh, in the particular area that they're looking at. Um, and this has been standardized to the extent that's possible in terms of defining a geographic buffer around each show sample household and looking at the built environment and nutritional, characteristic, nutritional environment characteristics. So maybe if any of you are looking for practicum projects, um, you can look into Wasabi or Show um, for opportunities. Um, so the idea here is that we can use this Wasabi built environment audit um, and connect it to data from the primary Show study. So we have Show questionnaire um, responses in terms of persons' uh, perceived indicators, how healthy are, do they think they are, and what do they feel about their own physical activity. Uh, and then we can also pair that with, with physical examination data to understand um, what's happening in Wisconsin in terms of the built environment over time and health. Um, so we talked a little bit about heat waves. Um, so this past summer, how many of you were in Madison or in the area? It was quite hot, right? So it was actually the hottest of more than 1,400 months that we've gone through since 1895 uh, in this region. This gives you an idea of the land and ocean temperature profile for this year from January to October. Um, how many of you, so I saw a Facebook post from a friend that said, if you're 27 years or younger, you've never lived through a colder month. Andrew, you saw that? Okay, and what, how did that strike you? It's terrifying, yeah. The situation may not be that terrifying because the figure that they were looking at in that article was this 332 months, right? That's someone who's roughly 27 years old. Um, that's a global average, and you need to be careful when you look at global averages, right? Because it's not the 
population-specific piece, potentially. So almost certainly all of us have lived through months that have been colder um, than previous records, but overall on the global average, that would be the case. For, so for some hypothetical 27-year-old, that would be the case. Um, and so <clears throat> heat waves are sort of the big, big hot topic issue um, in terms of climate change. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm making unintentional puns today. Um, and I mentioned earlier that they're, so they're associated with, with mortality, but also exacerbated endocrine diseases, diabetes, um, renal disorders, kidney stones, um, et cetera. Um, heat waves, I want to give you another example. How many of you have heard of this book by Eric Klinenberg? It's an awesome read. Um, and so this is basically a book that explored the consequences and sort of the drivers, um, more importantly, of, of the 1995 Chicago heat wave. Um, that was a situation in which about 700 folks died um, around the city. And so the CDC approach to investigating um, why that happened was to basically conduct an, a case control study um, matching victims' families. So they didn't have folks, victims to interview, obviously, these folks had died, but they're their families, matching those folks with, with controls from the same neighborhood. Uh, and so that study identified risk factors associated with heat wave mortality. And these are risk factors that probably would not surprise any of you. So what are some risk factors you might think would be related to, to dying in a heat wave? Poverty, yeah? Right, right. These folks are in general, older. Um, they were more likely to live alone than folks who, who didn't have health problems in the heat wave. Um, they were more likely to have medical problems already before they died. Um, they were more likely to be confined to a bed, right? You can't get out to an air-conditioned center if you can't get out of your apartment, um, and lacking access to transportation. Um, so the issue with matching cases and controls on neighborhood is that you can't look at neighborhood effects, right? Where are these risk factors likely to be concentrated? Where are there folks living alone? Where are there lots of old folks living alone, et cetera? Um, so this book is really great because it goes into depth and it conducts sort of that uh, gumshoe reporting to understand what neighborhood effects um, mean for risk in terms of environmental health. <clears throat> and so these are some somewhat legible figures from that book. Um, and so here, I'll just give you um, an idea of what's going on in the figure. We have shaded county, uh, shaded areas in the city, um, which are the areas with the highest heat wave related mortality. And then overlaid with that, we have the areas with the highest percentage of folks living alone. And you can see that there's um, an association there. <clears throat> this is another example looking again, shaded areas are heat, re heat related deaths and the highest rates. And uh, the Black circles here are areas of highest violent crime rates. So you probably wouldn't see uh, someone immediately suggesting violent crime as a risk factor for um, perishing in a heat wave. But it's important to consider that if you live in an area that's not safe, you probably don't feel good about leaving your apartment at night and going to a cooling center. Um, so it's important to consider not only the individual level risk factors for heat wave mortality and environmental health risks in general, but also important neighborhood and social effects that are oftentimes ignored because they take a lot more work to uncover. OK, so we're going to transition to some infectious uh, disease situations. So hopefully you're liking this like ripped from the headlines. I don't know. I'm trying to like spice it up a bit. So this is an example <clears throat> um, from Yosemite. Um, how many of you have been there? OK, so if it's not like the boulders or the bears that are going to kill you there, it might be hantavirus, which is um, uh, a disease that has a pretty high case fatality rate, it's about 36%, um, and it's associated so, with rodent and human contact, right? So this was something that happened um, just this fall. Humans increasingly are coming into contact um, <clears throat> with wildlife. In fact, three quarters of all emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. Um, so this is uh, just sort of a symptom of a, of a larger problem. This is a figure that you saw earlier this semester from, from Dr. Sethi in terms of the epidemiological triad and the pillars that we consider in uh, understanding overall risk. So we have host characteristics. Typically, we're, we're looking at humans in this class, um, the infectious agent, and then the environment in which that agent operates. We can moderate. We can um, adjust that model um, for an infectious disease situation in which we have a vector-borne disease. So I think probably most of you have heard of, of the term vector-borne disease. 
maybe. What are some examples of, of those diseases? West Nile. West Nile, right? What's that vector for that disease? Yeah. Mosquitoes and also um, birds, right? Any others? Lyme disease. What's the vector for Lyme disease? Ticks, right? Any others? There's a big one. Malaria, Malaria right? Um, so with uh, these vector-borne diseases, we need to consider both the human environment and exposure and risk, but also the environment in which the vector operates. How many of you saw this movie? What do you think? I mean, now Megan and I can't like touch anything on buses anymore because it's like <laughs> who coughed on whatever, right? Um, so what was the ultimate um, culprit at the end of the movie, the very end? What got Gwyneth Paltrow sick? A pig, right? But what happened to the pig? Why was the pig sick? The bat. Mm. The bat. Natural habitat exactly. It was deforestation and, and the bat that triggered the whole thing at the end. So you had to, you had to pay attention to like the last second. I had someone who fell asleep, and it's like you missed the, the key point. <laughs> anyway, so we don't have Kate Winslet here at UW, but we have my colleague Micah Hahn, who works in Bangladesh, uh, on a, another disease that's uh, closely related to bat populations. Um, and this is called Nipah virus. Um, this is an extremely um, fatal disease, a case fatality rate near 80% um, that causes encephalitis and, and seizures in folks. Um, so Micah works in Bangladesh uh, to understand patterns of uh, Nipah incidence and what the environmental risk factors associated um, with that incidence are. And so um, Nipah virus can be transmitted both from bat to human contact, but also from human to human contact. So here we've only highlighted the cases of spillover, um, so the zoonotic origin cases, the cases that we had um, a bat probably involved. Um, and so we've isolated those cases based on asking family members of folks who have died whether anyone else in the family was sick or whether that person had recently traveled to an area where there was a documented um, NEPA outbreak. So Micah is interested um, in this disease because it's got sort of an interesting transmission cycle. Um, and one that might not be readily apparent. So in Bangladesh, um, date palms over here on the left uh, are an attractive source um, because of their sap. Um, people make drinks out of the sap, they ferment the sap, um, and it's sort of a, a tasty treat. And so to collect that sap, folks climb way up those trees, I wish I could do that, um, and collect, collect the sap in these clay pots. And so they leave these, these pots there oftentimes overnight to collect the sap so that they have enough uh, to bring to market. Incidentally, it's been banned since early 2011, but it remains um, present in a lot of these markets. Um, and so these clay pots are hooked to the trees overnight, and these huge bats, they're called flying foxes, terapus bats, with wingspans, I looked it up the other day, like four feet sometimes. These are huge, right? Um, they're also interested in the sap. And so they come at night, and actually Micah and her team have these infrared cameras, and they've taken pictures of the, the bats actually sipping the sap and doing all sorts of other things that you can imagine with the clay pots. Uh, and so that's sort of um, the identified interaction between um, the bat and the human system. And so eventually this sap is brought to market. It's not tested oftentimes, and that's um, where folks at CDC think the, the contamination and the disease risk is conferred. Um, folks who are boiling the sap and, or fermenting it are not necessarily following protocol to, to disinfect. So Micah is interested in what the landscape characteristics um, of Nipah virus risk are. So here, this is a map of Bangladesh. Uh, you can see the spillover cases, so the bat-driven uh, cases in pink or the purple triangles, and also randomly selected controls throughout the country. Um, so this is a case control study that's conducted on the village level to understand the ecological characteristics um, that might be associated with um, where bats are hanging out and what that might mean for human risk. So as part of her work, um, Micah is interested in a number of population and environmental characteristics. So population density uh, and then a range of bat population characteristics like their, uh, the density of these roosts that they're hanging out in these trees and, and what the population structure is. Um, also the specific tree species that the bats prefer. Um, and also, more generally, village and land cover characteristics. So where are the waterways? Where are deforested areas, et cetera? Um, and so some early results that Micah let me share are um, comparing these NEPA belt controls, so areas um, in that sort of dark gray shaded area, those blue dots, 
are in the vicinity of identified NEPA cases. And those are areas that generally, compared to places outside the belt, have more fragmented forests. Um, and I thought that was sort of an interesting result to highlight because it might have implications for um, where bats like to hang out, what that means for deforestation policy, et cetera. So this demonstrates some of the um, sort of wide-ranging and unintended consequences of ultimate uh, land cover change drivers like deforestation. <clears throat> So I mentioned that MICA is interested in those land cover characteristics. Um, oftentimes, we take advantage of um, satellite imagery um, to understand what's happening on the land surface. So um, this is the field of remote sensing, which is a big strength here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and it's based, basically, we have lots of satellites flying around the Earth, right? And all but like two of them are probably running your iPhones and stuff. But we have got a couple that are taking pictures of the Earth to understand what broad-based land cover change looks like. Um, and so we can take pictures of the Earth. If we don't have clouds or um, problems with our instrument, we can understand over time what the land surface looks like and what um, is happening in different places. Here I want to distinguish between land cover and land use. So land use is what humans are actually doing on that land, right? If someone looked at a building like HSLC, they'd, they'd be able, maybe in some with some context to understand that this is part of the university, this is you know, an institutional academic building. Land cover is a more general term um, because a lot of times we look at the surface and we don't quite know what we're looking at, right? A desert actually looks a lot like a city in some areas because you've got really coarse spatial resolution, right? We might see uh, a lake uh, that looks like an asphalt parking lot. So um, we often use different filters and tools to distinguish between different land cover types, but based on uh, resolution issues, it might be difficult. So with these satellites, um, we have a trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution, and this figure gives you an idea of some of the issues involved. So here, um, we've got uh, a sequence of images that give you an idea of um, in decreasing spatial resolution. So up top, each pixel is about half a meter, uh, and we go all the way down here to an 80 meter pixel, and so you can see that we have an, a lot better idea of what ha what's happening in the upper left, right? We see houses, trees, a street, et cetera. Um, and at the bottom, that's basically a useless image for understanding um, what's happening on, on that scale, right? But maybe um, we, uh, we don't need necessarily household level information. Maybe we can understand broader patterns of change. So I mentioned there's this trade-off, right? We have spatial resolution, or how small is each pixel? Um, but we also need to consider change over time, right? In order to have change, we can't just have one picture of the land surface. We need to string together at least two and hopefully more. So if we're taking really high quality pictures, like the pictures that you see on Google Maps, um, those oftentimes are not all that frequent, right? We can't revisit small areas of the globe really frequently. That would take more satellite power than we have. But we can take bigger pictures of the Earth's surface more frequently. So there's a trade-off, and we need to consider those trade-offs um, when we think about what type of data co we're collecting and what, what type of health problem we're worried about. Are we concerned about little puddles that mosquitoes are hanging out in for malaria risk, or are we concerned about broad patterns of deforestation? OK, so we'll talk a little bit about air issues now. Air pollution epidemiology is probably one of the most contentious areas of environmental epi. Um, and that's because it's really hard, oftentimes, to distinguish um, and to connect causes and effects. We have lots of confounding variables that we've talked a lot about this semester um, that can potentially complicate um, the relationships. This is an example from the New York Times this summer in terms of the 9-11 Memorial Fund. And uh, the decision you'll see here, um, let's see. The decision released on Friday, vindication for thousands of people, uh, and then it talks about resistance from epidemiologists who weren't comfortable connecting polluted air right after 9-11 to cancer cases. Uh, one of the issues here is that we can't just consider the environmental epi results, but also the policy situation, right? The 9-11 fund, for example, was not going to be able to dole out money for decades into the future, but needed to decide, needed to decide at one point in time uh, what folks were at health risk um, from this disaster and, and how those folks could be um, <clears throat> compensated. Uh, incidentally, like a week after this came out, the World Health Organization 
uh, designated um, diesel as a, as a known carcinogen, one that's um, more harmful to human health than secondhand smoke. And so this is air pollution epidemiology is always changing, and we're increasingly um, uncovering new evidence in terms of health effects. Um, so I mentioned those 7 billion people earlier. This is uh, a quick schematic of where those folks are living. This is a population density map. And I want to contrast that map with this one, um, which gives you an idea of where we're monitoring one pollutant, particulates, around the world. And so what's the pattern here? Where are we doing a pretty good job of monitoring? Where are there lots of dots? China? OK, yeah. What other spots? Populous areas, right? Do we have a lot in Africa? No. Do we have a lot in India? There's you know, a billion people there. OK. How about United States or Europe? We're doing pretty well, right? And, and why is that? So part of the reason, you know, I'm from the, the Nelson Institute here, and I want to just briefly touch on sort of the environmental movement in the US and why we have good monitoring here and what that means for the type of research that we're able to conduct. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with the Silent Spring story, hopefully. Are you? OK. And Rachel Carson's book about DDT and the pernicious effects um, and unintended consequences of, of pesticide use. Um, 1970 really uh, marked a turning point in terms of environmental policy in the United States. So that was the year that the first Earth Day happened. Um, and then it was also the year that the Environmental Protection Agency, where I used to work, um, was established. And so along with that came a range of environmental legislation, in including the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act that implemented monitoring standards, monitoring requirements for states so that we could actually understand what's happening in our environment. So who is this man in the bottom right? I thought folks might not know. So this is Gaylord Nelson. He's a pretty important um, guy in this state because he used to be our governor uh, from 1959 to 63. And then for the next 18 years, he was a senator. And so Gaylord Nelson is the person that the Environmental Institute here is named after. And he's also the founder of Earth Day. So he's probably someone worth knowing if you care about environmental issues. So I mentioned the Clean Air Act. So in the United States, um, the Clean Air Act, the cornerstone is these national ambient air quality standards. Um, and so you can see here we've got these criteria, what are called criteria pollutants, that we regulate in terms of the levels that are acceptable around the country. And this is to protect um, human health and the environment. So those are carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide, uh, two sizes of particulate matter that I'll get into, and then also ozone and sulfur dioxide. And so you can see that we've got different levels and different averaging times. And the point here is that these standards are really um, strongly based in the epidemiology literature. And in increasingly, um, they're up for debate. Um, but we have a pretty tight sort of regulatory structure in the US for those standards. You might wonder how we're doing as a country in terms of our air quality. Um, this is a, a pretty recent map from EPA giving you an idea of how many counties are out of attainment, so how many counties are exceeding those air quality standards. Um, and so the different colors here give you an idea of how many counties, how many uh, pollutants might be out of uh, attainment here. Um, it doesn't look like a huge part of the map is covered, right? But actually, about 70 million Americans are living in, uh, in areas exceeding air quality standards for particulates. Um, and 120 million folks live in areas exceeding the ozone standard. Yeah. Yes, so exceeding these standards, right? Um, and so that has a range of consequences for states. Um, and there's different policy uh, sort of sticks that are used to encourage states to, to meet those standards. So um, places that are out of a, attainment or exceeding those standards uh, lose their, their federal highway funds. Um, there's enhanced oversight from EPA in terms of permitting and allowing new construction in areas. Um, and then there's also mandatory emissions offsetting. So if you're going to build a new coal-fired power plant, you're, you're going to have to find um, uh, savings in your emissions in, in other spots before you're going to be allowed to build that. Um, so I'm going to delve into just two specific air pollutants that we're concerned about for health. So you saw those arrows before. First is particulate matter. I want to give you an idea of the size of the particulates that we're talking about. So here we've got a grain of sand, with, which is about 90 micrometers, 90 microns in diameter. Uh, we work down to an average diameter of a human hair, or 70 microns. Then we get to even smaller particles, right? So PM10 is particles that are 10 microns in diameter or smaller. 
and PM2.5, which is really the one that we worry about for health, is even smaller. So particulate matter is a complex mix. It's both um, really tiny solids and condensed liquids, um, <clears throat> including acids, organic chemicals, nitrates, metals, and even soil and dust particles. Um, and so these particles are important because of the way the human respiratory tract works, right? So we have natural defense systems that can prevent our body from ingesting these larger particles. We'll either cough or sneeze or swallow, right? But these smaller particles, these PM2.5 um, particles, or, um, can often penetrate deeper into our respiratory tract, into our alveolar sacs, and eventually enter the bloodstream. And it's there that they cause a range of problematic health effects. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about air pollution and smog. So that's sort of the colloquial term, but ozone is what we, what we call it. Um, and ground level ozone is um, something that I want to distinguish from stratospheric ozone, right? So a lot of you probably heard about the hole in the ozone layer and why we were worried about that, especially um, in the 1980s, right? So stratospheric ozone is good for us. It protects us from the, har from the sun's uh, harmful UV radiation and reduces um, our risk for cancer. But smog on the ground level is a problem because it causes a range um, of health effects. So um, smog is formed when we have these nitrogen oxide gases interacting with sunlight <clears throat> and hydrocarbons. Um, and so it's um, what we see here in Los Angeles. Oftentimes, it's sort of the big um, air quality problem that people can, can easily uh, picture in their minds. Smog and ozone uh, are associated with uh, exacerbated asthma, bronchitis, heart attacks, um, and also susceptibility to infection and mortality, just like particulates. Um, so I mentioned the standards earlier. Um, and so these standards are often contentious pieces uh, of regulation in the United States. This is uh, an article from 2011 referring to the Obama administration's decision to basically keep the ozone standard where it was um, to reduce pushback from the business community. Um, building up to uh, uh, an election cycle. Um, and so in building these um, <clears throat> standards, people at EPA run environmental health models to understand what the population health impact might be of lowering the bar, right? What if we move from 75 parts per billion of ozone to 65? What would that mean in terms of how many annual deaths we could reduce, how many avoided trips to the ER we could, we could save? how much money that might save, um, the burden on our healthcare system, et cetera. And so um, through this you know, New York Times article, it mentioned something like 7,000 deaths, um, ER room visits cut by about 10,000, and acute asthma cases um, being reduced by about 40,000 just by this, this single policy change. So folks at EPA um, are running this BenMap program um, to basically combine various types of environmental and health data to build their policy. <clears throat> so this gives you an idea of the range of data that's needed to make such claims about what the health impacts would be of, of changing the standards. So we have an air quality delta, a situation um, that is modeled uh, in terms of what air quality would look like in the future. <clears throat> Population data, where people are living and what they're actually already dying of, because we need to apply those relative risk functions to, to baseline incidents. Uh, and then we apply EPI results to understand what the overall population health impact is. <clears throat> So this is um, an example of the types of epi results that are applied directly in policy. Um, this is data from the American Cancer Society's prospective cohort uh, mortality study. Um, a lot of you worked with this in module four, right, the cancer prevention study, when we looked at the effects of cigarette smoke. Um, so that study <clears throat> is also used in air pollution epidemiology to understand what the exposures, ambient exposures, not from smoking, but from just breathing air outside mean for health. Uh, and so this is a situation in which we used about half a million folks from the larger pool in the study and linked uh, their personal health data with information from EPA in terms of the air quality situation in the places where they lived to understand overall risk of mortality to, to exposure from air pollution. I want to show you just one result from that study. Um, and this is um, looking at the effects of exposure to particulate matter over um, sort of longer periods of time. 
So here I've highlighted the all-cause mortality relative risks, right? And we have two different time periods, 1979 to 1983, and then 1999 to 2000, and we've averaged those on the right with a confidence interval. So you can see that for every 10 microgram per meter cube increase in exposure, we see about a 6% increase in all-cause mortality, and that's a number that's directly applied in the model. You might be interested to know that here we've controlled for a number of confounding effects that we would expect to complicate that relationship between exposure and disease, including age, sex, race, smoking status, a really important one, right? Education, marital status, et cetera. Okay, so we talked about um, air quality policy sort of in isolation, but I want to give you an idea of the types of research that we're increasingly moving towards in environmental epi. Um, so you've all heard probably a lot of these characteristics, uh, these statistics in terms of the situation in the United States uh, of health, um, the rates of obesity and physical activity, or inactivity, I should say. Um, and so we're increasingly interested in understanding how we can motivate um, change to these increasingly depressing numbers. And so it's here where we begin to think about um, the term co-benefits. So this is um, a situation in which we want our policies to improve health, but also offer other benefits that can hopefully result in them actually being implemented. So um, our ideal is places, uh, communities that are more sustainable and livable. We would like to see more places where people, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, can bike to work or walk around um, more regularly. Uh, and the idea is that we would both be able to improve health, right? Um, probably the goal that a lot of us in here are most concerned about, but that we could also save these folks money if they have fewer health problems <clears throat> and maybe they're spending less on gas. Uh, we could reduce regional air pollution if they're not in their cars as much. And through that mechanism, we could also reduce uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases. So the United States, of course, has been historically the biggest uh, contributor to, to greenhouse gas concentrations. And so um, this would be sort of another benefit of, of a of policy for a more livable community. Um, so one project here um, that was recently in the news looked at the Midwest and hypothesized or sort of wanted to ask the question, what would happen if we made this reasonable assumption? What if we substituted bike trips for all short car trips in, in, this, in these 11 um, cities? Um, and we wouldn't have to do this throughout the year. We'd only do it during the warmest part of the year. And what would the population health impact be? What would the air quality impact be? And what would the savings be? Um, and so to ask a question like this, we need to involve not just public health folks, but a whole range of interdisciplinary leaders. So we have to do transportation modeling, right? We need to know where the roads are, how those roads are currently being used by folks, what sorts of trips are we going to substitute from car to bike? What is that substitution going to mean down the road for air quality? What will that air quality change mean for health, right? Using the results from that American Cancer Society study to understand what the health impacts would be. And then if we're going to switch people from sitting in their cars to actually biking, then we need to understand what the physical activity change is going to be and what that means for health. So these are some results from that study. Um, and so this is, gives you an idea of the re reduction in fine particulates around um, these cities. And so you can see that we've got Chicago highlighted, et cetera. And we can plug that into our air quality model and integrate it with health data to understand the change in mortality. So that's what's represented with these different colors here. So like you saw in the earlier graph, the places where we cut PM2.5 pollution the most are also the places that experience um, the greatest reductions in mortality. Um, and the take home here was that regionally we would save about 700 annual deaths and save nearly $4 billion if we made this pretty reasonable, well, some think reasonable change uh, in physical activity behavior. Yeah. It is, yeah. And so it's fairly modest, right, over the entire uh, region. Um, but when you aggregate with the population levels, uh, that's where we get that 700 number from. Um, so we've talked about dose-response relationships in this class in terms of causal criteria. Um, and I want to mention sort of challenges in dose response and new work that's happening to understand um, dose response for air pollution. 
So here's an example from India. How many of you have ridden in a rickshaw before, maybe in India or somewhere else? OK, probably fairly terrifying. Did you have to cover your mouth, or did you feel like covering your mouth when you were riding in one? No? You enjoyed it? Yeah, where were you? Which country? In India, OK. Um, so uh, in especially these urban areas in a lot of de developing countries, um, air quality concentrations uh, for these drivers can be quite high. This is a study that came out last year um, from folks at Berkeley. And basically, they drove around all day with air pollution monitoring um, equipment to understand what the exposure for someone who's driving around a rickshaw all day, you know, these things don't have windows. These people are directly exposed to exhaust from other vehicles, dust, etc. And so this gives you an idea of the profile of air pollution exposure throughout the day, right? So we start at 5 p.m., we end at 9.30. So we can see there's a clear sort of temporal trend that's it's increasing as we go throughout the night, and that's a characteristic just of atmospheric dispersion. Um, but you can see these huge spikes, right, in what's happening in the auto rickshaw compared to this rooftop site, one that's just stationary. And so these folks are exposed to extremely high levels of particulates, and we actually don't have a good understanding of what that high level exposure chronically means for people's health. Um, and so here I'll just illustrate where the Indian 24-hour standard for particulates is. So we barely meet it at 5 p.m., and then we're way off the charts by the end of the day. Um, so I do work in India on air quality, and it's worth mentioning that um, we're worried about air quality over there for a number of reasons, right? India and China have an increasing appetite for coal, which is a fairly polluting source of energy. It's both contributing to particulate matter but also to precursors of ozone. So when you burn coal, you produce these nitrogen oxides that are, that are clearly linked to ozone. Uh, and then we also have folks that are increasingly wanting to use air conditioning, right? It's a warmer planet. These folks are, thankfully, having um, more ability to afford things like air conditioning. But there's all these unintended consequences, right? We fixed the ozone hole problem by replacing chlorofor chlorofluorocarbon CFCs which ate with HCFCs um, as sort of a temporary fix. The problem is that HCFCs compared to carbon dioxide are 2,100 times um, more potent in um, favoring global warming. So um, this is sort of a theme that we've seen throughout the lecture, right? Unintended consequences of policy, um, well-intended um, policy choices. <clears throat> So we're interested in that high-level dose-response relationship because particulate matter concentrations in, in India are expected to be quite high in the future. This is modeling work that um, some of my collaborators have done to understand what um, PM 2.5 pollution might look like in the future. So this is a 2030 projection over here on the right. And you can see that compared to 2005, we have considerable increases across most of the country in particulate concentrations. So like I mentioned, um, we have data from things like that American Cancer Society study in terms of what exposure to particulates means for health. Um, the problem is that we base that data on information from air quality in the United States, right? And like I showed you before, we have a whole lot of counties in the United States that are doing fine in terms of the standard. We have air quality in developing, developed countries that generally uh, is between about 0 and 20 micrograms per meter cubed. So this is a problem of external validity, right? Like, can we use these studies that were conducted in developed countries and apply those dose-response relationships to other people, other places, and other times? Um, and that's sort of a question that remains out there in the literature. One approach um, to address the external validity issue is to take advantage of other FD studies. So we have information on what secondhand smoke exposure means for human health, and that occupies a range that's somewhat higher. We have information way off the charts in terms of what indoor air pollution um, is doing to folks' health and what active smoking is doing. And so it's based on those other studies that the World um, Health Organization <clears throat> has posited these new dose response functions. And so these are not linear ones like I showed you before, right? These uh, are exponentially decaying uh, at higher levels. And so a project that I worked on uh, recently is to try to apply these new dose-response relationships to India to understand how our modeling is um, comparing in, in terms of ultimate health impacts. So this is some quick results um, 
from that study. I'm sorry, this is kind of a, a busy figure, but I'll try to walk you through it. So on the y-axis, we have the loss in statistical life expectancy. How many lives, how many months off a typical Indian's life uh, are cut due to exposure to ambient air pollution? On the x-axis, we've got different regions in India, and I've ordered them from the areas that are generally cleanest to dirtiest in terms of just particulate pollution, so we're not considering other pollutants. Um, we've got these yellow triangles and blue dots, which give you a sense of where the current modeling, the bounds um, are in terms of population health impacts. What are our best guesses in terms of what the health impacts are of chronic exposure? And then these bars are breaking up that all-cause mortality into specific health uh, outcomes in premature mortality. So folks dying due to lung cancer, pulmonary disease, respiratory disease, stroke, heart disease, et cetera. And so you can see that over on the left, our models basically agree, right? Because we haven't entered that area of the dose response curve that we've changed. But once we go over to Delhi, our current modeling indicates something that's pretty far off from the current estimate. And so this is an area of disagreement in in the literature, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future, but this is an example of dose response questions that remain out there to be examined. Okay, so I'll wrap up quickly with a discussion briefly about some, some water issues <clears throat> and then policy. Um, so this is just a picture from Sandy to, to drive home the point that we're also concerned about these changes in the hydrologic cycle. So water quality and sanitation remain a problem uh, even in the United States. This is an example just from the newspaper last week in terms of contaminated drinking water in California's Central Valley where there's lots of agricultural activity. So this is groundwater that's contaminated with pesticides, animal waste sometimes, fertilizers, et cetera. Uh, and we're worried about particularly um, two types of health effects. So acute effects um, are important in terms of microbes, bacteria and viruses in the water, um, and especially for vulnerable groups like the very young, old, or already immunocompromised. Um, and then also chronic effects of exposure to pollutants in drinking water. Um, these are generally chemicals, radionuclides um, like radium, and minerals like arsenic, so the Aaron Brockovich type thing. Um, and so those health effects are more, more chronic, like I said, so things like cancer, liver and kidney problems, um, and also effects on reproductive systems. <clears throat> so this is the example from Haiti. How many of you are familiar with the cholera outbreak that happened in Haiti? Okay, yeah. So this um, was sort of, um, a, a, you know, a terrible sort of consequence, uh, an, an, another unattended consequence of aid that was being delivered to the country. So cholera um, killed about 7,000 Haitians and sickened more than 500,000 um, after the earthquake. Um, so that's more than 5% of the total population in the country. Uh, and so it's a controversial hypothesis, but what folks think happened is that uh, a UN camp was the source, potentially, of this epidemic, right? So we had a Nepalese peacekeeping troop member who had contracted cholera but was an asymptomatic carrier. He didn't feel that sick, or maybe he had mild gastrointestinal problems, but he didn't feel sick enough to tell anybody, at least until after the fact. And so due to sanitation problems that were already there due to infrastructure issues surrounding the earthquake, um, contamination made its way down a waterway and eventually, uh, eventually ended up triggering this outbreak. And so this is an example of the types of ec epidemic curves that you guys constructed in your first module. What type of epidemic is this? Starts with a P. Propagating, right? So we have um, people becoming infected um, from multiple sources, right? So in addition to the water quality and sanitation issue, we'll just touch briefly on the water quantity issue. So warmer air ex expected under climate change is able to hold more moisture, and so that's why we expect these heavy precipitation events uh, to increase in their frequency. And that's a problem because, at least in um, places like Wisconsin, we have a lot of combined sewers. So these extreme weather events often overwhelm um, our water systems and can result in contamination of these systems. So this gives you an idea of the amount of water that these systems handle, um, more than a trillion gallons, something that would keep something like Niagara Falls running um, for 18 days. And so that's, that's the annual total of the, the amount of water that these systems handle. So if we have more frequent storms, 
where you expect more overflow events. Um, and this is an example of what happened in Milwaukee in terms of E. coli. Um, and so you can see that after a storm uh, overflow event, we have pretty high concentrations <clears throat> of E. coli close to where people are swimming. They're, they're on these beaches, right? And it, it gets better as we get out into the lake, but I don't know if that's necessarily an, an encouraging story. OK, so we're going to wrap up with just a quick discussion about policy and, and opportunities for, for intervention. Um, how many of you have seen this social eco ecological model before? OK. Who wants to walk me through sort of the general approach? What's, what's this showing? Why is this important? I knew that would not get anybody. OK. Um, OK, so basically the take home here for me is that health status uh, is determined by interaction between our personal attributes, those things in the very center of the circle, um, and the environment at different levels, right? So we have sort of the individual level, and then we work our way up, all the way up to broad social policy. Um, and so it's worth considering how we can, oh geez, how we can address this mic. Um, environmental health risks at various scales, right? Are there things that we can do to reduce both personal exposures, but also help the bigger picture in terms of global climate change? So what's this a picture of? Election. This is the election results. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, I look at that and I say, wow, most of the country is red, right? But then we adjust it for population size. And you can see here that we have much of a closer contest, right? And so we can use these types of um, data visualization um, to understand what environmental health um, policies are doing. So this is an example of another. These are called cartograms, where we adjust the size of different countries, right? So this is uh, looking at drivers of climate change um, and carbon dioxide emissions between 1950 and 2000. So we've adjusted the size of each country based on its historical emissions. And we look at historical emissions because the lifetime of something like carbon dioxide is like 100 years in the atmosphere. So we can't just consider what's being emitted today, right? Because then China is actually exceeding what we're emitting. But we need to consider what the historical record is. So you can see that we've got a pretty big portion of that driving force. This is an estimate, one estimate, of what the impacts of climate change are in terms of health. Um, and so this is relative changes in incidence of diarrheal disease, malaria, inland and coastal flooding, and mal malnutrition between now and 2030. And so you can see that the countries highlighted here are the ones that are big here, are the ones that are fairly small here, right? So the folks that are most vulnerable to climate change-related health outcomes are probably the least responsible for, for driving climate change as a whole. Um, so I'll close with one final example, and this is of indoor air pollution and a situation that sort of addresses that whole picture. Um, so in a lot of developing countries, we have folks that are relying on polluting solid fuels um, for their activities of daily life to cook and heat their homes. So they're using um, animal waste or crop waste, um, wood, etc. these relatively dirty sources of fuel to, to operate. Um, and oftentimes they're living in poorly ventilated dwellings. Um, and oftentimes this is women and children who are more exposed um, than the men. Um, and so this problem is actually pretty big in terms of an overall uh, global health impact. Um, WHO estimates almost 2 million annual deaths are attributable to indoor air pollution exposure. And that's almost 3% of the global burden of disease. Um, and so we're interested, and Secretary Clinton at the State Department has made this one of her big projects before she takes off, um, to basically conduct cooked stove interventions to um, replace the current stoves that folks are using and hopefully do it in a way that's acceptable to these folks, because that's key, um, with fuels um, and renewable sources of fuel that are going to be much more clean burning. So we'll be able to imp improve people's health because they won't be breathing in basically all of these particulates and this, the smoke in their homes. Um, but we'll also be able to potentially reduce problems of deforestation, right? People won't have to go hunting or spending hours a day looking for fuel. Um, and also, ideally, uh, reduce the growth of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think with that, I will wrap up with just a look at sort of the energy ladder and how we're trying to kind of leapfrog from these dirtier sources, right, crop residue, dung, et cetera, 
not have them use things like charcoal, but move um, beyond where we are to, to more renewable sources of energy. So with that, hopefully I've given you some taste of topics in environmental epi. If you're interested in more of this, you should sign up for this class that my advisor teaches. That's Jonathan Patz. Um, that'll be in the spring. If you have any questions about it, feel free to ask me after class. Um, and with that, I will wrap up and thank these folks for their help. And thank you guys for your attention. Thank you.